2008. We're meeting today with Mr. Hugh Arnold at his office in Greeley, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Hugh, and thanks for participating in the project. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay. I was born in November 1924 in Galesburg, Illinois, from a family that had been the pioneer settlers of the town. My great-grandfather, surprisingly, just several generations, uh, because my father was 45 when I was born. He was the youngest of eight. So we went back in three generations to 1836 when the town was uh, selected, the town site. And my great-grandfather, uh, Henry Ferris, came out to Illinois and camped in the winter in the woods and so forth and selected that town site, went down to Springfield, patented the land, which just happened in Greeley. They bought the land from the government for a dollar and a quarter an acre, and then it was sold to the settlers for five dollars an acre, which provided the endowment for Knox College. And so our family was very vested in the history of that town, and uh, um, and in the college. My grandfather was a trustee, my brother was a trustee, my mother taught there, and so forth. But anyway, uh, eighteen. Many, many years. But what I was going to say basically was the family had really been prominent, you know, and they had they had eight uh, siblings, most of whom stayed in Galesburg, and I was surrounded by them. I was the youngest of 20, 25 uh, of my generation, and I they were much older than I, and many of them quite venerable, and they lived in large houses around where we lived, and then come the Depression, it became a very striking difference because when I was growing up in the Depression, all the family seemed quite poor, extremely so. I mean, they all had great debts and things, which is what made them poor. And, and uh, my, my recollection was of the town being, or my family being low on the totem pole. My mm -hmm. mother taught to pay the grocery bills and things. My father tried to tried to save the family farm which he had bought from his brothers and sisters, all eight of them in just before the Depression at the high prices, borrowed the money and then he was trying to pay it back with three and four cent hogs and five cent cattle and thirty cent corn and all that. So that was my recollection of my youth and uh, we still lived in town in a, in a nice house but uh, it was always on the verge of being slipped out from under us as well as the farm. Were you aware of that fact? Oh, I was extremely aware. Oh, boy. I, I just grew up with it. I, I was, we had a, my dad had a 40 acre uh, subdivided, a plot of land at the edge of town, which he and my mother had subdivided and laid out with uh, curving streets, which was very different from anything in Galesburg, and planted beautiful trees on all the streets. And as a boy, I grew up carrying water to those trees out in the pasture. and and putting up hay over there with my dad. And uh, I remember particularly being there at uh, one time in the summer with him. And the sheriff came up and, and he was going to foreclose mm. on Ray. And dad knew the sheriff. Dad was a lawyer, but he ended up just being a dirt farmer trying to save the farm. And uh, I remember he held the pitchfork out between him and the sheriff and said, no, Joe or whoever it was, don't hand me those player papers give me till tomorrow morning. So the sheriff did, and I thought, my gosh, you can't put a pitchfork towards him. But he wasn't threatening, he yeah, was just right. saying, please, hold off. And the sheriff did. Somehow Dad got some financing from another bank, and that he never went back in that old bank, which was run by the the town, uh, the town uh, political uh, head guy, and had all the money and everything, but Dad never set foot back in that bank. He saved the farm. But I also remember going to Chicago, riding up with the freight train in the caboose. When we sold our cattle, we had a herd of 50 or 55 cows that we ran for two years, for now long enough that they had their calves, and then we raised the calves. And then after two years, we sold the, the fat cattle, which weren't very fat, but they were somewhat fat. And that was the produce of the farm, which 
was to pay the mortgage and and uh, keep us alive while my mother taught college to, at a hundred dollars a month to put food on the table and so we rode the freight car as the Burlington Railroad always gave you free transportation up and back when you sold a load of cattle and we sat on the corral fences in Union stockyards for three days and nobody would buy our cattle nobody mm. would bid on them and it was just I didn't know a lot about the process of so on but I could see this was getting pretty desperate and finally my dad sold them and I sort of heaved a sigh of relief but it turned out he'd sold them for just pennies and uh, I saw tears in his eyes when he did it he was a strong man I don't think I ever saw tears otherwise but anyway we went back and carried on and uh, so I went through high school and all the school and I had a wonderful time in high school I, I played basketball on the high school basketball team which was a great honor that was a, a center of the town's activities and we it was a town of 30,000 in the Hillsburg High School Silver Streaks named after the Burlington Zephyr which was the first streamlined train was the Silver Street and uh, we uh, uh, we had a good basketball team and, and that was a, that was a heck of a lot of fun but my senior year of high school I was I was you know not really working in school or doing anything and my folks were very much focused towards education and a family friend of ours were heirs of a, the Loomis Institute which is a very fine prep school in New England which the Loomis family had endowed all the tuition so you only paid for your room and board and I got a scholarship for that because family didn't have any money but they were so into education so they felt that I should go and I sort of shared the feeling it wouldn't hurt and that was the fall of 1941. Mm. I remember being... This was your senior year? Yeah. Okay. And I entered that school with the kids that had most of them been there three or four years and it was the most challenging academic thing I had including law school and going to Amherst College and Colorado College. It was extremely challenging but I, uh, I loved the challenge and I ended up doing fairly well and making some lifetime friends with uh, one of the professors, particularly my English professor, we corresponded until he died and each year when I wrote him at uh, Christmas it was carefully written as though it were a paper because he was extremely demanding in, in what he expected of someone that was writing something and great guy and so uh, anyway I, you know, I very much remember uh, uh, Pearl Harbor Day. Yes. And New England had an air base that was just being completed. It wasn't quite done, called Windsor Locks. It was just eight miles up from Loomis. And they had all of four P 40s there stationed to protect the eastern seaboard of the United States. And they were roaring up and down the Connecticut River Valley that day. And, and you know. Was, was there a feeling before that that oh, we much. were going to get into the yeah, war? Very okay. Much so, yeah. Okay. And I was, I followed it closely the summer before. My family was. My uncle had served in the British Expeditionary Forces in World War I and as a doctor, he was a doctor physician and uh, that summer we listened to all of Winston Churchill's speeches during the Battle of Britain and uh, we were, uh, we, we vacationed up in Michigan, so two families in the same cottage and, and we'd every night listen to those wartime speeches, I remember them all well and I have a record with all of Churchill's wartime speeches on it. And I've often felt that Winston Churchill almost single-handedly saved the free world by his valiant, strong urges to carry on. And when the times were very dim, he, he gave England the will to continue until we later on could come and join him. But uh, So anyway, I, I was very aware of that and uh, I had proceeded to always be very interested in airplanes and army airplanes and they had a distinctive roar and as a kid they used to run out when they were flying the mail and they'd come roaring over our town and I'd <laughs> run out yelling army plane army plane you know and so I knew where I wanted to head and I did. Do you know do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you'd heard Pearl Har Har Harbor was born? Oh sure I was at Lomas and it was Sunday and it was uh, right before chapel we had to go to chapel every Sunday and we came out of chapel and learned what had happened at Pearl Harbor and uh, 
know, he didn't know quite the scope or he said, but you knew the war had come and the war was anticipated, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and finally happened and all that. So we, uh, we went on and uh, that summer I worked, uh, had a good job for a change. I worked in the ice plant where they really made big 400 pound blocks of ice that they chop, you could chop up into 100 pounds, but we you, wouldn't. You came home for the yeah, summer? Yeah, okay. yeah. And I loaded freight cars with those 400 pound things. You could lift them up and put them on end and so forth. And it was wonderful because it was cool and paid 62 and a half cents an hour, which was big in those days. And so I enjoyed that and I enjoyed the relationships with several of the girls that I still know very well and who are very nice. I've known my wife ever since grade school, but I never dated her. I dated all her friends and she dated my best friend a lot and uh, several other of my good friends. So we've always known each other, but uh, we didn't start dating till after the war. So anyway, then I, uh, I uh, went on and went back and went to Amherst and I, oh, I, I'd gone up to Amherst when I was at Loomis and I just walked up there by myself and knocked on the door and talked to him and, and they gave me a complete scholarship, a full board job ride and full ride tuition and board job and uh, so I also had the same offer from Swarthmore and I was debating which to go to and well in those days I think it was easier to sort of get that kind of, I don't know, but anyway I I, I just think a whole lot of it, I just thought that's good and uh, I uh, I went on to Amherst that fall and just had a wonderful time and was treated very, very kindly because uh, they weren't hazing the freshman much at that point knowing that we were our days were short lived at the campus and and I uh, I've worked with all the athletes that usually the, the big men on campus all had board jobs and things and I knew all of them pretty well and I felt very much at home at Amherst and the, but however the my birthday was November seventeen, I guess nineteen forty four, excuse me, nineteen forty two and I enlisted almost, I'm sure, within a day or two of that time I went down to Springfield and enlisted as an aviation cadet, which, you know, there's no assurance you were going to make, but you certainly were going to try out for it. And fortunately, I went through all the physicals and passed them and was accepted. You had to be 18 before you got yeah, enlisted? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And so then, and just before that, you had to have two years of college. They had just waived the two years of college because I was only half a year through yeah, college. Right. So I, uh, they were they were backed up though with uh, with uh, quite a few applicants. So it was uh, somewhat of a delay till you were going to be called up. I was called up at the end of January, uh, forty three, and went in. As uh, fine, I, I went up to Amherst, went down to Springfield. I remember and got the troop train and wandered all over New England. Went up to Camp Devons, which is up in northern. Mass for lunch and then went on down and ended up in Atlantic City, which you'd think might have been a nice place, but those hotels were boarded up within an inch and I was miserable down there. But uh, and we, was, yeah, basic training is meant to be miserable. I don't think I realized it quite that much. I just thought this is the biggest screw up I've ever seen is the way they're running this basic training thing. Well, the intention was to, to make it seem pretty like anything goes and you better take it no matter what. And, and how was that initial transition from civilian life to military life? Uh, you had, how was your transition? Well, that's when it was. Yeah. And, and, you know, it was very demanding, but because I know we'd, we'd go out and stand on the beach in the cold, raw wind of February and just freeze our behinds and not move and wait for the darn corporal who was in charge of the whole 150 guys or so to finish his leisurely cup of coffee and an hour later to come out and curse us and treat us like the worst scum in the world. And uh, I just, you know, I never hated anybody so much in my life. He was a great big Polak, about 6'4", good looking guy, spoke very use guys and so forth, but oh my, the very last day that we were there, we had sort of a party and we all got together. And he came up and he said, well, you guys, he said, uh, I'm just a dumb corporal and you guys are all going to go on and be officers someday and he said I just hope I've taught you something that may save your life someday which was take orders and don't question them and put up with what you have to put up with. He was doing all of that on purpose and I thought 
From that day on, he was my hero. I mean, I thought he taught us well, he cared, and he did a good job. So then we went on down to college in Birmingham, Alabama, which was a wonderful change to the line. Balmy springtime of, of Birmingham, Alabama, at uh, Birmingham Southern College. And uh, there had been another group of cadets that had been there a month before us. And because they had all these students for, that were backed up in college, they took a fifth out each month and replaced them with another fifth. But the first month, first contingent out was the other guys who'd been there two months. But for some strange reason, they had a couple of dropouts in their sicknesses, I think, and then instead of replacing them with people from the group that had been there already, a guy named Shreve Archer and I were selected out of that new group, so I was only there one month. And Shreve was the son of S.M. Archer, his name was Shreve M. Archer also, who was the founder of Archer Daniels Midland, and also he was a director of the, Burlington, or the Great Northern Railway, and he helped to start Northwest Airlines. And it's very interesting. So Shreve and I went all the way through flight training and, and, and part of the time after that. And uh, But Shreve and I were the only two in this other group. In the meanwhile, however, we'd become... Any idea why they chose you no, two? No, I, I think, I, I, I got to say, it was on it was on our tests. Okay. And uh, I didn't know I'd done that well, but I had obviously done that well. Because that's how they were selected. And so... Uh, um, yeah, you never knew how you did. I was no pounder when I was selected. But. So anyway, the uh, I had been, well, as I said, become very close friends with some of the guys in the other group. So we went off to, uh, to um, pre well, first of all, we went to classification at Nashville, Tennessee, where you learned whether you're going to be a pilot, bombardier, navigator, and you know, all wanted to be pilots. And they chose more pilots. They needed more pilots than anything else. But... We all made pilot, which was the next great step, and all was going swell. You still knew that about a third of you were going to wash out of flight training, but and you didn't know whether you could handle it or not, or fly an airplane, but uh, you did. We then went to pre-flight at Maxwell Field, which was sort of the west point of the air, and very, very uh, back to treating you like a cadet at West Point. The first month you were there as an underclassman, and then the second month as an upperclassman. That month you had to eat a square meal and walk on the line down here and never turn your head from side to side and be punished for any any infraction anybody could think of. And, but it was wonder It was in the spring of 44, and it was 43, and it was a beautiful weather. And I remember I'd never run miles and miles before, but you went out and landed, you could drop, and you did everything. You felt, and you sang and marched with pride. You went, went through pre-flight, and then you went to primary. Well, again, you never knew where you were going, but we were on this troop train for a couple of days, and, you know, they opened mail car with you, with a wood stove in it that you cooked the food on, and you <laughs> did your KP up there, and hung out the window, and looked at the cotton fields and everything, and, we ended up in a wonderful town called Lakeland, Florida. A beautiful town with our airfield was a former civilian pilot school and a, a training for pilots and it was on a lovely lake and we had a nice bar barracks and it was run by uh, civilians. And so that was just a neat time. We flew the Stearman, which was the basic primary trainer in those days. It was an open cockpit biplane and flying that over the bayous of Florida, chasing chasing cranes and storks up the bayous, not knowing that they could probably kill you if you hit them, but just having all kinds of fun. Can I interrupt here? Yes. Uh, you, you'd said how you used to love to watch the airplanes fly yes, over as a kid. Right. Had you had you actually ever flown before? No, you... never had, never had. And so it uh, turned out it was great. I, I, I really Everything you expect. Uh, nothing wrong. So we went on to primary and uh, the next stage we went to basic, which was flying a much more, for those days, a, a real real airplane. It was all metal, low wing, heavy, heavy throaty engine and all. And the basic trainer, it's called we called it the it was a BT-13, the Volti, we called it the Volti vibrator. It was a noisy, reckless plane. But that was a real airplane and, uh, however, there were, uh, that was an era of uh, 
There are lots of lots of casualties, lots of crashes. In oh, really? Don't love. It's a hard airplane to fly, very much so. And so uh, there are a lot of guys killed in basic. And so after about uh, two or three weeks, we were scheduled to have our first night flight or the first night solo. We'd been up at night with our instructor. But the first time he went up alone, and he'd always been cautioned a lot about, about against getting vertigo at night. It was easy to, strangely enough. All of a sudden, think the skies were the ground, the stars mm -hmm. were the lights of the ground, and, and get disoriented. And uh, you were constantly reminded to always keep your eyes on your instruments when you're night flying, so you kept your orientation. And uh, we all went up and, and flew uh, in a pattern, in a, in, a, in a box up in a certain altitude, in a certain quadrant, and, and uh, till we were called in to shoot our landings which occurred and which we did and I went in and I heard him call my friend Yill Eighties, who was my roommate and who was the, he was one of the guys from, from our college thing in the older attachment. He was always sort of the top top guy and he was a very outstanding guy and he was the head of all the cadets at Cochrane Peel and he did everything right and he was a great guy from Purdue. I mean, he wasn't just a, a Johnny Good to 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 he was just a good guy and yeah. a good leader. And uh, he was my roommate along with a guy called Don Armstrong, because that was the only place we had our own rooms. And uh, Gil was fatalistic about that night, and for some reason he kept saying, well, you know, he said, I'm going to wear my dog tags. We, you're supposed to wear your dog tags, but we didn't. And, and uh, they might want to know who I was. You know, he was sort of being a little bit fatalistic. But anyway, he did not come in when they called him. And he did not come in, and he did not come in. And so my friend Army and I spent the whole night down on the flight line waiting for something to unfold. And I, after three or four hours we knew that something bad had happened, but we joked that he probably had uh, landed in a farmer's pasture and was in bed with his daughter by that time and so forth. But uh, it, the, the premonition was it probably wasn't that way. And he could have easily gotten lost. And, Thrown out into the Atlantic, which wasn't too far away, or into the Gulf, which wasn't too far away, or he could have crashed somewhere, but there was no report of a crash. Well, four days later, I was flying with my instructor when uh, somebody got the glint of a flash of sunlight off of some metal down in the swamp, and they were circling it, and they needed somebody else to can help them to locate it, to pinpoint it, and we went down, and yeah, there was this flash of light, and the planes wings flashing. Uh, you couldn't see much, but yeah. it was just a glimpse. And so we located the place and they they sent a detachment of soldiers from the nearby Camp Wheeler Army base into the swamp. Now this was about, I think, about four miles from the end of the runway down there. But the swamp was so dense down there, it took those guys 24 hours to get into the wreckage. They radioed back that, of course, he was dead and there was nothing left. but. And it took him another 24 hours to bring his body out. And so it was four days before his body, while they'd gone in, found him, and come back out again. Mm. And uh, so then uh, they always sent one of his classmates home with a body when somebody died. And I went home with Gil's body mm. to Louisville, Kentucky. I'm still not 19 yet, I'm still 18, and pretty mm. young. But and I was the youngest of all those guys. They were all older than I was. They always called me the kid, but they were very good friends. And I'd been going to be Gil's best man. He was going to be married when we got our wings. And so I took his body home to his family and was there. They said, stay as long as you feel you're doing good. And his mother just clung to me at the wedding, at the wedding, at the funeral. She uh, held onto my hand all during the funeral and talked to me all during the funeral and said, that's not Gil up there, is it, Hap? That's, that's not Gil, he's all right, isn't he, Hap? You know? And there were just four of us sitting in this huge, on uh, this hill overlooking the Ohio River, the cemetery, and there were about a thousand people around standing. And But he and I and his dad and, and his girlfriend were the four people in the chair. And I stayed about a week because she didn't want me to leave, and then I finally realized I needed to, it was bad for her, so I went back to, and of course, you got a week behind in your dream, right, yeah. it didn't matter. But anyway, 
Two weeks later, a guy named Bade, who had slept above me, and we slept in double bunks in primary, and we had the same instructor. There were five of us that had the same instructor. And he was a real nice guy, but a rather clumsy guy, and he was sort of, and at the end, his our instructor was talked to him. He said, Bade, I ought to wash you out. You'll kill yourself in basic. You fly an airplane like people drive tanks. I remember him saying, and he said, uh, but I'm going on, I'm, this is my last class. And then, of course, Bade was, oh, please, 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 you know. He said, I'll, I'll pass you if you want me to, but I'm warning you. Well, two weeks after Bill's, Gill's death, Bade crashed and burned and killed himself and his instructor. So those were two weeks, two guys I knew mm, awfully really well. Wow. And I sort of felt like, well, you know, I think maybe the war is here as much as it is anywhere, but, uh, you know, it's sort of close at home. But uh, we went through, and we went on and went to Moody Field at Valdosta, Georgia, which was a wonderful air base, too. Uh, I mean, it became a permanent military base. It's still active. And uh, uh, so we, we uh, had a great time down there flying the twin-engine HE-10, which is a much, much more of a real airplane. And, uh, and, uh, Everything went well, and we, we graduated, got our wings, and then the good thing was, what assignment were you going to get? Were you going to be troop carrier command, which wasn't very good, or were you going to be probably most of the guys, the most demand was for four-engine pilots. We were all twin-engine at that time, so we were what you call multi-engine. We weren't fighters. Mm -hmm. and uh, Or what was it going to be? Or actually, truthfully, the pick of the assignments was being an instructor. And uh, and I didn't realize how much of a pick until I became an instructor and started picking guys for it. But anyway, uh, I got picked for an instructor. I did my best friends, so there were four of us out of about seven guys, out of about two others that were going to be instructors. And uh, so that was a great experience. And I <coughs> I did that for six months, during which time, after I finished a class, I had. Uh, I had to pick. I had an airplane I could fly anywhere east of the Mississippi River, as long as I didn't spend overnight and go and see the world. And just, you know, just be king of the air. And we were sort of that way when we flew in the clouds down in South Georgia and out over the Gulf of Mexico. And one thing that happened when we were down there was another guy that was one of the seven of us. His name Bill Arthur, who I, is the only guy I'm still very close in touch with because he's the only one that's still alive. Uh, and who was probably the most conscientious pilot of us all. He, he didn't drink or raise hell, and he, uh, he was, uh, had been a pilot that had his license before the war and everything. And he and I were on a designated low-altitude cross-country training flight. It's the only time you had to legally buzz. You could fly as much <laughs> as you wanted to and rip the top off of anything you saw. And so forth. we were crossing the corner of the Gulf of Mexico, and he and I were flying very low on the top of the Gulf of Mexico. And um, I think I was flying off his wing. And I think he turned around to look at me. And he looked, the cadet had the controls. And the cadet probably put a, a millionth of an ounce of pressure on the controls to use the water. And uh, the cadet was instantly killed. But the nose of the plane ripped off. And Bill, the water came in and pressed Bill back against his seat. So he wasn't badly injured, and it was, in a sh it was, it was only 10 feet deep or so out there, and, and he sat out in the wing of his airplane for waiting to be, it was sticking up out of the water, to be rescued by fishing boats. And that is the Army always did, why you got hell if you were you know, in an accident, and they arrested Bill for buzzing, which was legal and all, and they, put an armed guard on his door, and he here was the most conscientious yeah, pilot yeah. in the group who was under arrest for the rest of the time. And uh, we all went on and finished our job. We were still instructing, and he was up there, and I'd go up and see him a lot. But uh, So then that summer, the war was getting along, summer of 44, and, uh, and they were pulling instructors out and replacing them with guys that were coming back from overseas. And bit by bit, they would replaced a lot of the instructors, but uh, I was still there. I, I should say, incidentally, that my best friend then, besides Gil, was the other roommate, a guy named Don Armstrong, 
whom I stayed very close to until he died a few years ago. But he, uh, he and I were flying one day, and Army partied. We all partied a lot, but Army was a good partier, and and he was, I think, quite hungover that day. And he was flying the plane. And he came in and misjudged his landings severely and landed, as I said, about 20 feet in the air, and then came careening down on his wheels. <coughs> and the tower called, and we were sitting there, and the tower said, you know, called this plane, said, who's the pilot of that plane? And he, because he was flying, and he had the obligation. He said, Lieutenant Armstrong, sir, and said, well, report to headquarters. And 24 hours later, he was off to become a B-24 co-pilot. And so he did that, and he went overseas and flew his tour and wasn't shot down. And I met him. He came down. He had just finished his tour when I got overseas, and he came down and saw me off on my first mission. And that was I stayed around while I flew first couple of missions. Uh -huh. and so anyway, uh, 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 that was that. And then so oh I know so at that point then. I still wasn't on orders, but another guy then who was instructor got orders. He was married, had a kid, and I got to thinking, well, you know, I'm young, I'm single, and I'd really like to see the war, so I mean, I'm dumb, but I'm glad I did. If you didn't get hurt, well, it was a heck of a deal. And so I asked if I could swap with him and take his place and go to, he was on orders to go to B-17s. I'd been waiting around hoping that I got something a little hotter, but they were sending everybody they good to be 17 so I went down to Sebring, Florida and learned how to be a first pilot in B-17 and it was like, I'll never forget, landing that plane the first time and came in over Lake Okeechobee and went down across there and it was like flying a house. It was just like a wow. house, it was just huge, you know, big, 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 big old waves out there. And, uh, was was, that, was she hard to control? No, I mean, no, yeah. it was a good plane to fly. Yeah. And, uh, but it was just the sense of you know, it was a lot more airplanes, a lot yeah. different than yeah. flying a small plane. But so then, uh, I I mentioned this, but I I never forget. Like we'd fly at dawn a lot of times, and we'd be up at twenty five thousand feet or something. And I remember daybreak over Florida, where you could see the sun rising out of the Atlantic and setting over the Gulf. And in those days, that was so unusual. You know, now everybody flies it. Yeah. But that was most unusual. Right? Well, but in those days, too, things were a lot different as far as you, were, you weren't pressurized, were you? Were oh, no. Uh, and, so uh, you had oxygen yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, warm clothing on? And, yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. exactly. Especially in Europe, we had a lot of that. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a thrilling time. And uh, I remember going down over Havana, Cuba, and flying low over the harbor. I got a picture of the three points of us, like looking down. And, you know, it was just see the world and all. And uh, at the end of the training, and, and then after after going to learn the, what they call transition, where you learn to be a first pilot, then you got your crew and trained for 10 weeks with the crew. And we trained right up the road from where I'd been at other school at Sebring, Florida. We trained at uh, Avon Park, Florida. And uh, uh, again, out in the swamps with the alligators all around and everything. And, uh, um, a friend of mine crashed in the swamp one night, but he was able to get out and he again sat on the wing all night with the alligators barking. Oh, jeez. You know, it was a lot. Of but uh, one thing we did do that was fun and exciting was at the end of our training at Avon Park, we took a long cross country wherever we wanted to. And so I was able to fly up to Iowa City, which is the nearest runway at that time, and it was a dirt runway and, and a short one to land a B-17 on, but we flew up there and my folks came up and, and uh, we spent the night in Iowa City, the crew did, the whole crew, and my folks were there. And Is that the first time you'd seen them since you'd gone off to, to uh, the service? Or I, had you I'd gone home for a week when I got my wings. Okay. Because okay. the only time I'd been home. And uh, so, uh, 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 we were... The next morning was, you know, very, very cold, and the plane was all froze up, and, and we couldn't get the engine started. We worked all day, messed around. We didn't have any ground crew there to help us in trying to get those darn engines going. And the engineer, a guy named Rustin, who was responsible for that, he, we didn't know any of us do it. But we finally got the plane going in the afternoon, and we took off in this short runway with high-tension wires at the end of the field, so you had to really get up in the air. 
and just as we were committed that we couldn't turn back, one of our engines went out. Oh boy! And we jerked that plane up off the ground and over those high tension wires. Didn't hit them, and went into Des Moines, Iowa, with a burning engine. And uh, Des Moines, Iowa, was a famous service town because it was full of ladies that worked in the insurance offices, young ladies, and young ladies who were in the WAX, which is the WAC headquarters, and no military. So that was the service town of the world. And we went in there on one engine, and they used to say, before a plane set foot down at the airport, every young lady in town was all dressed up and headed for downtown. And they did, they met us on the streets as we were walking down the streets with their arms like saying, you're crew number one from Avon Park, Florida. We were always crew number one because I was Arnold A. Okay. And uh, usually I was the lowest in the alphabet. And uh, we had quite a time. We were there for a week before they were able to send a plane up to get us. Our, our plane probably still stuck in the crappy, scrap heap out there. But, um, um, so we went down and, and finished our, our tour. Another thing that was sort of fun was I did, on that one leave, when I went home from Moody Field, I decided that I, I had such a short time that rather than take two days to take the train back, I'd chest my luck and uh, go out to the Municipal Airport in Chicago, which was the only airport at that time, and try to hook a ride with somebody. I figured there'd be somebody I might know or there'd be some way to do it. Well, I got up there with not too much time to spare, and there were literally a couple thousand guys all registered and in line waiting to get a flight. Oh, geez. I don't know when heck I was going to get a flight. And so I saw a plane out there from our air base in Florida from Moody Field with its tail markings. It's not usual, but it was there. And so I waited till those guys came and I caught them. I said, I ain't really going to get a ride home. You know, I said, okay. You go down about a half a mile down the edge of the field and we'll pick you up as we go by. So I did. There was a fence down there and everything. I waited and they came by. They stopped. I went under the fence. I raced up. I got on. The tower was calling B-25, Moody Field, return to, return to ramp, return to ramp. They kept on going. The jeep came out with the MPs. Ah, turn around, turn around, turn around. We went on and, and off we went to Florida or to Georgia. Anything more about it. That was a real deal. So there were a lot of fun things, you know, just live, live for the moment. And uh, so with that, I, I spent all this time talking about training, but it was, it was a fun part and an interesting part. So then we, uh, we finished our training in Avon Park and were sent over to staging at Savannah, Georgia, where you got all prepared for overseas shipment and they either gave you an airplane to fly over or you went, on, you went up to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and went over by ship. And one shipment of guys, one group of guys went by ship, and the next group of guys flew their airplanes over. And I was in the group that was going to fly our airplanes over, and that was about three weeks from the time we got there. Well, it turned out that one of the crew members, uh, the pilot of a preceding crew, had gotten sick, so they had to cancel their orders. And on 24 hours' notice, we took their place again because I was crew number one. And uh, so instead of flying our own plane over three weeks later, we went up to Kil Kilmore, New Jersey the next day. And we went through all that careful issuing of equipment, right? And in no time I realized later on that I had one black flying boot and one brown one. And <laughs> few things like that were yeah. a consequence of the hurry that yeah. we went through. But uh, we went up to Camp Kilmore, New Jersey and then took the Queen Elizabeth over which was quite an experience. Yeah, talk about that. Here, yeah. Here's a guy from the landlocked state of Illinois, and yeah, 20, I've heard, heard all sorts of stories about the, those those crossings. Just, well, 20, did you get your sea legs? 20,000 guys. They did, the British treated officers well. We were 20 of us in the stateroom, and it was, you know, that four of you deep and all that in the small stateroom, but that wasn't bad compared to the enlisted men down the hold. And uh, we didn't get, we got fed twice a day instead of three times a day, but we ate like we were British royalty. We were in a beautiful dining room or eating off of their fine china. Not china, it was metal, but it was beautiful. Yeah. And ordering off a menu. I remember I used to have kippered herring for breakfast, you know, and all kinds of fun things. And uh, and you're only, that was a five day trip and the Queen Elizabeth went by itself. And it was supposedly fast enough to avoid a submarine. Wow. 
submarine had ever accidentally stuck a tube in it, it would have 20,000 guys out in the icy North Atlantic. Yeah, been, no uh, chance. Unbelievable. But uh, we got into Scotland, I'll never forget going up to Firth and Forth, into Glasgow, every nook and cranny for 50 miles up there, some giant aircraft carrier, battleship, oh, so much, oh, so much stuff. Was mm. Just, you know, stacked up, going there, you're going there. And then uh, we got up, we got off the ship in Glasgow and got on a British plane. Well, they'd sent us to a, a British replacement depot for about three days. Didn't know where you were going to go, but we ended up at an airbase called Blatton, which is that one right there. And and uh, our crew did, and uh, and we got down there, and it was uh, very exciting to be to be over in the war zone. And uh, we trained for about three weeks, and they made sure that we were ready to go. And then we flew our first mission, and after that, we just flew missions. I can't believe me, I flew four missions of twelve hours apiece in five days. And before you flew a mission, you spent about three hours getting ready about an hour of debriefing and everything. So I would get in the back of bed about nine at night and get me up about two in the morning. And that really, really, and you're flying formation for eight hours, 10 hours a day, you're breathing oxygen, you're at 40, 50 below zero. It was, it was just a really, really amazingly demanding time. Well, physically and mentally, I flew 14 missions in a matter of three weeks. Just, it usually took about six months to fly 35 missions, so I was really, really flying them. Let me interrupt you. How did, uh, here you'd lost a, a number of friends in training. Yeah. And, and the the Air Corps over in, in Europe was taking amazing uh, casualties. Well, at the end of the war, they weren't that big, okay. but they were always, but they but were did, significant. I mean, I did think... That, did the, the, the fear, that, was there any fear in, in your thoughts with, with those two things? Uh, the, the, I mean, the chances are that I mean, you were flying into harm's way. Did that, did that mentally ever play into you at all? You were, in, you were in terror most of the time. I mean, in a sense, you weren't, you know, sitting there going, rrr, rrr, but at the space of your school you were because it wasn't only the, the various factors, but the weather was yeah, unbelievably right. bad. Right. And we had lots and lots of accidents that didn't count in the Casualties. We also had some other interesting things that added to the casualties more than at the time the average. But uh, uh, the weather was just amazing, and you'd fly in light out clouds, you know, right in front of your face for two hours trying to climb up to altitude. A B-17 climbed at about 200, 300 feet a minute. You had to climb up to 20,000 feet to get up above the clouds, and there'd be 2,000 airplanes mm. in a relatively small airplane milling around, climbing, 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 and I've often mentioned every once in a while you'd fly along and boom, your plane would just boom, go like that, and you'd flown right behind where a plane had gone in the, what they called the pop washer. Oh, jeez. Oh, and, uh, oh, you never knew, and there were lots of, there were frequent mid-air collisions and all kinds of things, and, but just the mere flying in, in those conditions was difficult. Well, then when you got Flying combat, you were flying in contrails where you couldn't see, or you're flying in weather where you couldn't see, hanging onto somebody's wing, and all of that was not easy. And there were many accidents as a result of that. But we, you know, we didn't suffer. I, as I learned later, though, they didn't have a plane shot down every day out of their bomb group. They had one or two one day, and none for a week or two, and then maybe one, and then, and uh, so we had several uh, different occasions. But uh, we. Uh, it was the weather as much as anything, and uh, my, my, my worst mission, almost was my first mission when I never dropped my bombs because we, uh, long story, but the, the and navigation equipment, and we were forming on a radio beacon over in France, and it was out, and the plane the group was going to form, that means get into mm -hmm. formation, which right. is a very complicated procedure, it takes about an hour, and the lead ships circle slowly, and the other planes come in. You know, you don't just take an airplane and put it here. You come sliding up, and if you go a little too fast, you go over. You, you know, you got to ease your way in there. And they don't have any brakes in the sky. And the uh, only brake is you cut your power. But uh, uh, we uh, we got over to France, and the butcher was out. In the meantime, we'd had a fire on the plane, and I saw the navigator and bombardier down the nose. The armored gunner, not the bombardier. We didn't have one by the time, but. With their fire extinguisher, and I said, you know, what's going on? I said, well, 
our G box, which was our radar navigational equipment, had burned up. Oh, geez. So we got over to France and we had no idea. We never found the button. There was no way we could team up with the group. So then we tried to look for them and we flew around, we flew and flew and flew and looking for some planes we could join up. And I had what was supposed to be an experienced co-pilot with me. Usually they put me as a pilot with another crew and I would fly as co-pilot with them. But in this instance, they, I didn't have the benefit of that. I was, the pilot was always in charge and I was stuck with it with this co-pilot whom I never had seen before. And, and we did see a group and I tried to, I thought, well, maybe we can catch them, maybe we can get in one. He said, oh, no, 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 they'll shoot us down if we try to come in. They'll, they'll, or they may be going to Russia. And, and he said, they'll think we're a German uh, captured plane coming up to raise active. No, no, you can't do that. Well, it was wrong. And I kept thinking we could, but, you know, who who knows more? The guy that's flown a bunch of missions, me, I'm in yeah. charge. But, yeah. So I remember, well, I let him talk me out of it. I wish I hadn't. But anyway, it was worse the way it was because, we finally, we finally just had no idea where we were. We were figured we were over Germany. We were all by ourselves, all alone, wandering around. So we started blindly letting down through the clouds. We were totally in yeah, the clouds. Right. And we let down, let down, let down. At about 10,000 feet, we broke out of the clouds. And we were in a big valley, and there were mountains all around. Oh, and now we threw the heat on and climbed out of there, didn't run into anything. And I asked the navigator, I said, well, did you get any idea of where we were? And he said, well, there are mountains in the... Scotland and Sweden and Switzerland. The Pyrenees, he said, take your choice. <laughs> so we ended up having nothing to do. We flew east, west, back towards England, hoping to intersect the British Isles, which was a darn good chance we would, but no yeah. guarantee. And back in the British Isles, they had a system called Darkie that would, uh, would locate lost planes, that they had civilians manning every 15 miles, and if a pilot called Darkie, they would tell you if they heard you, you're in this vicinity. So <clears throat> you'd, hello Darkie, hello Darkie, where am I, and so forth and so on. Famous story was, hello Darkie, hello Darkie, you black bastard, where in the hell am I? <laughs> that, was, that was one of the stories, but anyway, uh, we called Darkie and found out that we were over in southern England and, and got a fix. And, Made it back to base and landed in the dark and brought our bam our bombs back and landed with our bombs. I couldn't drop them. I didn't yeah. know where we were. I might yeah. have dropped them on London. Right. But that was a big no-no to land with your bombs at the airbase. Could have blown up the whole airplane. We did a good job of that and, and uh, we got ourselves home. So then uh, from there on it was just fly every day and uh, we had, as I said, type of mid-air collisions and that. I mentioned that picture on the wall was of Miss Ida, which on our fourth mission flew up at the end of the runway with with Major Dozier, and that was a you know he was a very well known, well loved guy, and just just couldn't even get that off the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he had a little loss of power or something. So anyway, it, it was just a wonderful experience, uh, and before you know it. Nobody thought the war was going to end like it did. I mean, when I got there, we hadn't crossed the Rhine or anything, and they thought it would be six months or so. And we went through Germany so fast, although an awful lot of the ground crew said, the ground forces said they had some of the worst fighting in the war going through Germany because sure. the Germans kept fighting. They pulled their flak guns back so they had more defending their cities. And then they had this new jet fighter, the ME-262, which came into service about in the first of the year, which was uh, just light years ahead of anything we had, way ahead of anything we had. And they were so effective, and they always said that they hardly ever attacked a B-17 formation without taking a plane or two with them. And, and all the groups were, you know, nobody had ever seen a plane without any propeller before. Right, yeah. And uh, we, uh, we, we're all waiting, you know, when are we going to get jumped by jets, you know, and I heard this group got jumped yesterday or that. The Germans didn't have a ton of them left. They built 2,500 of them, but they had a lot of trouble with fuel and parts and pilots and everything, and so there were usually 40 or 50 of them in the air at any one time, and uh, not the whole mass. We all thought if they all came up at one day, they'd shoot down half the 8th Air Force. Yeah. But... Uh, 
all of a sudden that was on uh, October, I mean April, uh, April 6, 1945, we were over Berlin, and all of a sudden there they were, and they attacked us. Wow. And uh, it's so fast when things like that happen, it's so vivid in your memory. And the co-pilot was flying at the time. And so I was, I was probably the only guy on the plane that didn't have something he had to be doing. And all of a sudden every gun on the plane opened up, and the tail gunner, you know, we'd never fired our guns before, and you know, you didn't fire your guns for practice up in the air. Yeah. And the whole plane was just shaking, those guns going off all over the place. And I looked out my window, and just right beside me was this gorgeous plane without any propellers, uh, ME-262, still a beautiful airplane, beautiful. Still one of the best looking airplanes. Where's that picture I have there? Oh, there it is. And that's, that's a picture, a painting that was made of that day. Of that day and that particular, I've discovered that later on. That's our bomb group up there. It's that time when the Germans attacked our bomb group over, uh, what does it say, where that was? It was right outside of Berlin. I'll show you, I think it says. It's called uh, Escort Fury, a brush with history. And uh, see, there are the 17s. Just, this is all just a painting. But, yeah, right. And apparently, these jets, after they attacked, you know, with such speed, they ran out of fuel very quickly. Okay. And they would glide down and land on the Autobahns and stuff. And that's when our P-51s often got them. In this case, the picture is, and I think that happened. The P-51 did get this guy. He lived, and his story's there, he's talked about it. But this was us, this was our day. Is this that was, right, This huh? was, uh, uh, let's see what day was it? It was April 6, 1945, yeah. And uh, they shot down the plane on our right wing. I didn't even know it, I was on the left side of the airplane, the next thing I knew the plane was gone. And I thought, what, what happened to him? And I only learned he got shot down. And then uh, they went down and shot down the group leader, and we had gotten stuck behind the group because my Bombay doors had frozen open as they often did, which slowed us down. Mm -hmm. And then we were leading a three-ship formation, and the other planes had to stick with us, so that, <clears throat> that one got shot down as a result of that. And the plane on our other side had a big hole shot out of his tail. We didn't get any damage. And if it was our plane that caused it. The group had gone off and left us about a half a mile behind, which wasn't what they were supposed to do. The Germans went down and shot down the group leader, the colonel that ran the, that was leading the group. And all of which happened so fast, but the picture of that plane, it was just something I'll never ever forget. Wow. It was just right there. Yeah. Now. So uh, that was. Uh, Part of it, there were some, just so many interesting experiences. One was a very simple mission at the end of the war when we were bombing a pocket of Germans that had been surrounded and left behind along the French coast, along what they called the Jerome Peninsula. There was a pocket of about 20,000 German soldiers there. And so for lack of anything better to do, we went down to bomb them on a real milk run. But on um, that day we had flown uh, low, which we didn't normally do, into France and done an air show over Paris, the whole 8th Air Force. Oh, is that right? Oh, wow. And then climbed down and went down into their bombing. And as often happened, the simplest missions were often different. What happened was on that mission, one group of planes dropped their bombs on another group of planes, which happened occasionally, mm. and knocked down several planes from that point of view, and there were always some reason. And our bombs, we were carrying, the only time we ever carried this size bomb, we had two 2,000 pound bombs and one 1,000 pound bomb above it. Normally we had 500 pound bombs or 100 pound bombs or 250, never had that big of bombs, they were huge. And what happened, we were flying right below the lead ship in the diamond formation and the lead ship boys he let his bombs go a smoke marker went out, and as we flew along, there was a terrific jolt on our plane, and our plane filled with smoke. And you know, what happened? Well, we filled with smoke from the smoke marker, but we didn't know it. And the jolt was that the 2,000-pound bomb on one side did not release, and the 1,000-pound bomb above it dropped on it, oh. bang, 
And so that bomb's what you call live in the bomb bay, which means it's ready to go off. And it's, it's stuck in there. And I thought, oh, lordy, lordy, we're up at 20,000 feet with oxygen. And, and there's a bomb, there's a catwalk about 12 inches wide to walk on. And we got to get out there and get those bombs out. And so uh, we went, and all we had was a pair of pliers or something. And we had a, and have oxygen walk around bottles and the uh, the armorer who was responsible for that and uh, the engineer and I all got out there and they had a they had a screwdriver a pair of pliers and they must run they got the shackles released and the bombs dropped off out over the out over the um, Atlantic the yeah the, the, the north not the North Sea but the Bay of, it was it was southern France and uh, had they not gotten that out, we would have had to bail out. We couldn't have landed with the bombs that way. They right. sure shook up and blew up. And so uh, that was good. And uh, oh, there's just so many neat things I not need that were just a coincidental as could be. A kid from my hometown who was a B-24 gunner, got shot down, and was on a prisoner of war train outside of Munich uh, on a certain day. We were bombing a town, 40, Engelstadt was about 40 miles from Munich. We got to talking after the war and so forth. He talked about watching the Air Force, the 8th Air Force drop its bombs. Is and that I said, right? Oh, what day was that? Oh, I think it was so and so. What town was it? Engelstadt. I remember looking down and seeing a train outside of town. Is that right? And, uh, and we, we dropped our bombs, but we circled, so I got a chance to look back. We obliterated the town, but I. So distinctly remember that train out there, and he was down there watching the thing, you know. It was Isn't that all something? Those yeah. huh. So anyway, uh, we got over, and uh, again, because we were crew number one, the 8th Air Force was redeploying to the Pacific, and they were going to go into B-29s, and uh, they flew 25 planes a day home, and five from each of five different groups. We had five from our bomb group, and because I was Arnold, I was one of the five. So we flew home the first day. They flew many planes home from England, and we came into uh, the airfield I'd watched being built when I was in high school, just eight miles away, and we landed, and Paramount News was out there, and the mighty 8th Air Force returns from Germany, you know, and very heroic return. And what a change, you know. Four years, just three years before watching them build that area. Uh, a short time. And I still was not quite 21 when I got home. I went down to Roswell to New Mexico to train in B-29s. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, and I, I had a, I got a collapsed lung down there. They said it was not uncommon again when people had been sucking out of an oxygen mask like for had hours and hours yeah. and hours. And, uh, I was just flat on my back. I didn't get out of bed for three weeks. But uh, and they said I'd probably have that once or twice a year the rest of my life, especially at high, high altitude and with exertion. So I, uh, I tested it. I played basketball in college, and I came out to Colorado, and I climbed mountains, and I never had another one. Is so <laughs> anyway, I got discharged early right from the hospital, and I was back in college in September of 45. And uh, I, I, I was two weeks late after college started. I, they were welcoming me home because there was a small college with about 1,200 students, but there were... Were you home. back to Amherst? No, then I went back to my hometown where my oh, okay. family and my mother taught. Okay. And because uh, I had been home for about five years, and uh, hmm. so I went back and Phyllis lived right down the same, my wife lived right down the same street that I lived on, and she was a junior at that time. and. I, I was just still a freshman, and I, uh, I guess I got enough credit to be a sophomore out of the service. And uh, we started singing the college choir and things. And she, I, I was very conscious of her being my best friends. He still was very much for liking to reestablish with her, and and I, I would talk to her about it. She would show no interest, and I'd sort of, you know, give her heck and wonder why not. Well, I finally, I finally decided that. It was for real. She wasn't going back to him, so somehow I thought, well, I guess I will. 
we stayed close friends. I was best man at his wedding with another lovely lady that he married. And uh, Phyllis and I have had a very good life since then. How oh, wonderful. But still happily at it. Wonderful. Well, do you mind if I go back and ask no, you some I'm questions? No, I'm sorry. I really talked stream of consciousness. No, that's good. It's was good. that all right? That was wonderful. And we'll go back and just uh, just ask you uh, some questions. Sure. Uh, so at that point in the war, uh, aside from the from the new jet fighters, uh, the regular fighters were out of the air. You didn't have much worry with German uh, fighters attacking. A certain you. amount, but certainly but not. But mostly it was the, the flak that we were. Uh, the flak was very heavy. Talk about there flying into fighters, talk right? about fly, flying into flak and what that's all. What, well, what's that? Lots to talk about is like walking in a way on on just black clouds out there, and of course at first they look sort of harmless. they we used to call them black puff poly, but every one of them was just loaded with steel, and. Uh, the first mission I took after the one that we had all the trouble on was to Bremen, which was a Bremen, which was a pretty heavily defended target, and uh, there was a ton of flak there, and, and uh, we got hit, and it would sound like somebody throwing rocks at you, because you couldn't hear over the sound of the engine. The normal, you, you couldn't hear the shell burst, but you heard it when they hit the plane. But it wasn't, any, you know, it didn't hit any vital, didn't hit anybody. It was just like throwing rocks at you. We got home, we had a bunch of holes in the plane, but uh, that, that that was thick, you know, I mean, there was, was a lot. So you begin to learn that there wasn't just pretty funny stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it just, what would happen would be, when you were flying in flak, when it got close, it would bounce the plane around, so you know it was quite close, whether it's, whether it's through threw a lot of stuff at you or not, and you, you felt the concussion. And, uh, the Germans had a hard time down there, hitting you from in those days from five miles below you in the ground, picking the exact right altitude to make those shells explode. They had to be timed exactly to explode at your altitude. And, uh, but they had a lot of it. And they threw a lot of black stuff up in the sky. Mm. What was it like? Uh, can you describe to us what it was like once you got into formation? You know, seeing all these, you said at times a thousand airplanes. What that? Uh, you couldn't see that? them all because yeah. they were stretched out. But you'd usually see the group ahead of you, which was thirty-six planes. The group behind you, which was thirty-six. Even just thirty-six you know, is yeah. an oh, amazing know. amount. Of, a huge yeah. amount. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was a gorgeous sight, you know, to see all the contrails and the daybreak, and you know, sometimes it was just beautiful. Sometimes it was terrible weather. And uh, it was all different things, but it, more often than not, at that altitude, the, although it was 40 or 50 degrees below zero, and right. it, it, you were, as long as your, your electric flying suit worked, you were not uncomfortable. You couldn't uh, get your hands out or anything very easily. But Talk about conditions inside the airplane as far as it, the, the cold. Uh, you, you weren't pressurized, so you had. Uh, your oxygen mask, and you said you had electric uh, suits to... Yeah, well, you had tons on. You had, I used to think you had uh, your regular underwear, then you had a, you had long wool underwear, and then you had a wool army uniform, and then you had a flying suit, and then you had a great heavy jacket, and you had flying, fur-lined flying pants, you had a helmet, and you had a mask that came up to your nose, and you had goggles over so you didn't have any of your body exposed, and you had a leather helmet, but when you were with the target, you had a regular heavy steel helmet, helmet. and uh, you uh, uh, then you had a May West, which was the life jacket, and then you had a parachute strap, and you had your, uh, we had a backpack, so we kept that on. Most of the guys had a chest pack, which they took off and sat down right beside them, and they could clip it on rapidly, but we had a backpack that we had on all the time. And uh, oh, and I was trying to think of the number. Of, oh, we also let's see, we had. Uh, oh yeah, we also had silk. We had silk flying stuff too. It's, it's very warm, so we had about six or seven layers of clothing. So you were comfortable. I mean, there was. Uh, but you couldn't move very yeah, well. But, uh, but uh, comfort-wise, as far as temperature, you're, you're you weren't terribly uncomfortable. Okay. No, you weren't sitting there freezing to death. No. I've always been curious. I've climbed into these airplanes. I've always wondered how you guys ever would have got out if you had to, to ditch. I mean, it, it seems like... Yeah, well, different ones were different. They all had their very, very thoroughly studied and practiced procedures for getting out, ditching or bailing out. Yeah. But uh, 
uh, in our plane, the guys in the foot went out of the, what they called the, there was an opening outside of the bombardier navigator compartment, and I could either duck down there and dive out or just step back and go out the bomb bay door, depending on which was open. Okay. I was probably, would have been the last one out. I was going to keep the plane mm -hmm. as level as I could, so the others, with the plane, if it was in a spin or something, that was yeah, very hard right. to get out of. And, you know, my goodness, when you, if nothing happened to you, it was a great war. If you got in that kind of trouble, it wasn't so great. So, now you said earlier you were flying with different crews, or did you fly, did you have your own crew? No, I was with, with my crew except that one mission. Oh, okay. I, I, well, one, right. I didn't mention that, but one okay. mission I was called on to fly another crew. Gotcha. Didn't okay. know a soul, but okay. we, we got along fine. And, and how many missions altogether did you end up flying? Fourteen. Fourteen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was all crammed in right at the end of the war. Uh, what was life like on the base? What, well, what would you do on nice. your time? I had a bicycle. We all had bikes. and. And uh, we'd drive and ride our bikes over to the farmer's house, and maybe she'd fix us an egg or something if she had an extra few. And, and uh, we'd go into London once in a while, which was a, quite an experience because London was full of soldiers from every country, and Gurkhas and Turks and Indians and, and just thousands and hundreds. A of lot thousands. of damage still there as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, not not. Dis not you didn't have the sense of total destruction. I think that was perhaps more congregating in certain areas. Downtown London was not terribly damaged. Uh, they all, Buckingham Palace, they all got some damage. But mm -hmm. It was a wonderful country. I was very proud of the British. I felt that they really held up and endured far more than any of the rest of us did. Yeah, yeah. And they were short of everything. And, what, what was it like uh, preparing yourself to go up on a mission and then conversely coming back? How did you decompress from that from that mission? Uh, well, you know, I haven't thought too much about it. You'd come back and you were awfully happy to be back and you had to go into debriefing where the intelligence people asked you all about it and they gave you a shot of, shot of brandy or something which you didn't have access to much otherwise. And you maybe drank some of your friends if they didn't drink. And, <laughs> and, uh, well, not too much, but... Anyway, you uh, did that, and then, as I said, sometimes we got home way after dark. I can remember then going to the mess hall, and they'd be watching a movie there, which I did at nights often, and, and eating in the dark, pretty much by myself, getting a plate of food from the kitchen, and eating and going to bed, and then having a guy come around and wake me up at 2 in the morning and say, get going, but then it, you're on again. You never knew until they woke you up in the morning. And, but four, four, four days and five was just unheard of, sort of. I mean, it was a, a lot of them. And uh, both physically and mentally, that had to be very draining on you. I it was. Yeah. I remember uh, by the end of some of the, uh, yeah, I remember being extremely fatigued. But mm. I remember flying home from one mission, and and we were done, and we were, weather was decent, and we were coming back and hearing about Roosevelt's Oh, death. right, yeah. <laughs> Which was significant, you know. Yes. Yeah. We didn't have the radio on a lot from that point, for that type of thing, but everybody was talking about it that day. You, you remember where you were and yeah, what you were I thinking? Think I was probably um, pretty much coming over the English Channel. Yeah. What about uh, when you heard about uh, VE Day and the German surrender? Do you remember where you were? And well, yeah, we were done. We'd quit flying about two weeks before they oh, yeah, stopped okay. the bombing because we were. Getting yeah, too close to the Russians and gotcha. stuff. I think we flew our last mission on April 20th. And uh, but we, knew it, we knew it was just about there. And uh, and VE Day was very exciting in England and all. And yet it was, I mean, it was sort of an anticlimax. You knew it was coming. And yay, right, it was a good excuse to have a huge party and all that. But I just sort of felt like, yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. It's over. It's over. But it wasn't like, Oh my God, it's over! You know, it was. You know, no sense of relief at all. Oh, it's over, and well, I've, it was I've made it through that. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Yeah. What what route did you fly home? Uh, then back to the states when you flew back. Well, to we it? flew down to Valley Wales, and then we stayed there overnight. And took off the next day for Iceland, and uh, we were flying a very old airplane that I had flown several missions on. And it was the oldest plane in the group. It had a hundred missions on it which didn't throw me real much flying over the North Atlantic, but because we lost planes coming home. You lost planes all the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, 
we got into Iceland and it was pretty bad weather and we had a little trouble finding our way, but we managed. And so then we were stuck in Iceland for four days because of the weather. And then when the weather cleared, we flew to Labrador, to Goose Bay, Labrador, flew over the southern tip of Greenland and you know, saw the ocean just dotted, dotted with salt, salt, little salt cubes down there of uh, icebergs and, <laughs> and uh, got into Iceland and then the next day flew down to this airfield that was being built. I remember I had an opportunity to, to buzz Amherst College and the <laughs> tower on the hill and over it and to buzz Loomis and then to go land on it. And within a, we went up from there up to, up to uh, Miles Standish up in Boston and then from there back to uh, Fort Sheridan, Illinois, and then for a 30-day leave, which was neat in, in June of 45. And uh, that, was, that was nice. And then when were you discharged? And I went down to Roswell, New Mexico for B-29. Oh, that's right, yeah. And I got discharged. So there was still a chance that you were going to go over well, to the I Pacific Theater? Definitely, definitely expected to. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was, the war was, there was, you know, Japan was going to fight to the death, and it would have lasted and lasted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think, again, in the Pacific, a lot of the problem was, as you said, Long, long flights. The B-29 was a wonderful airplane, but it had probably more mechanical problems than the B-17. Oh, really? Those okay. very high-powered engines. They, they had a lot of problems losing airplanes for that. So it was not a simple flight, even if you... And the Japanese were... Still had a lot of suicidal people around. And, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So we had no idea it was going to get over that quick. Nobody knew anything about the atom bomb. If that hadn't happened, it was... We were going to invade Japan in November. And by that time, we would have been back over there probably. Right, right. What, uh, you remember hearing about that and what your thoughts were, you know, what, what's this, this big bomb that killed these many, I mean, was it hard oh, to fathom? And yeah. Uh, yeah. I was down not too far from where they did that down in the Roswell, uh, we were down in right. Roswell, New Mexico, right, it was yeah. over the mountain. I did not see the explosion or anything, but we uh, realized that quickly that something gigantic had happened just over the hill that was... Is that, right? yeah. that was when they tested the bomb. They yeah, had three right. of them. Yeah, they tested yeah. one. Right. And of course, you know, the Japanese didn't know we didn't have any more. That was a pretty good kept secret. Yeah. Because they yeah. figured well, we're just going to get our cities just destroyed one after another, I suppose, is why they were able to reluctantly talk them into surrender. It wasn't in the Japanese nature to surrender. Right, right. Hmm. What was it like as far as uh, communications back and forth to home and uh, V-mail and such? Was yeah. that pretty reliable? And, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, very. Yeah. And uh, it was all V-mails that we fed up. And I don't, I think my mother probably saved most of mine. I'm not sure where they are. But, you know, she wrote off and then I wrote. And then the, all the girls back home wrote. And it was just, uh, we wrote lots of letters from yeah. the war. Speaking of your mother, did she ever talk about what she was going through while you were over there in, in harm's way? And not a as, whole as a lot. Mother not a whole lot. And I often thought about, it, so I grew up and had kids of my own, and what it was like to yeah. send me off and say goodbye. And it was not. She never showed a lot of that. Is that, that right? Here, no. yeah. but, uh, I know she felt it. Uh, let's see. I thought of something else I was going to mention about. Well, it doesn't matter. Huh? Think of it. <laughs> no, I think we'll put her on here. Yeah. But, uh, let's talk then uh, a little bit about your post-war experience. You return, returned home and went to college at yes. uh, your hometown there and uh, graduated. And then, no. No? I went, okay. I went two years and then the summer of 47, we decided to, I was already going to Colorado College. Oh, okay. I had applied. I, I, I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in Galesburg and I thought it was time to get on again. I had been accepted at Stanford the year before. But because of my wife, I mean, at that time was involved, and I waited around for her to graduate. And so then, I, since I had not accepted Stanford's largesse, I, CC was another good choice, and I went there. And our honeymoon was a one-way trip to Colorado, and we've lived here ever since. And, and you but, gra uh, graduated from CC then? Yeah. Okay. And we, uh, well, she, we, uh, we got married in September 7th, 40. 47 there, and all our friends were there, and at the wedding reception at Phil's house that afternoon, why, they loaded all our wedding stuff at the back of our 41 Chevy, and off we headed for Colorado, to the great unknown. My wife had 
never really spent any time away from home. She worked one summer up in Indiana at a lake, but she was not accustomed to being gone like that. She was a very, very good scout about it. And we we how had an interesting you, experience. How did you choose to, to go to CC then? Because uh, it was an excellent school. Yeah, and yeah. It was like Knox, which my folks had taught. I didn't like Amherst, mm -hmm, small mm -hmm. liberal arts. And, mm -hmm. and you went on to get your law degree there as well? No, or? they don't have a law school. It's, okay. But I, I didn't intend to to go to a law school. I was I had a job with Goodyear Tire and Rubber in their training program. And it was going to, you know, I had a potential for leading to good things. And my first assignment was going to be after I had worked about the summer in Denver, learning everything from changing cars to tires to retreading to the line, all that stuff. Yeah. It was very good. And I had been working one afternoon, moving a great huge earth made earth mover tire that was twice as tall as I was, and a bunch of us holding it up in the back of a truck. And I passed a bunch of my friends at CC who had gone to CU Law School. And I'd always thought about going to law school, but because I had a family, I didn't think I could. Right. But we lost our first baby that, that spring, and that sort of changed my dynamics. And so I went up to CU Law School two weeks after school had started, one Saturday, and went up to the dean's office, and the dean, of course, wasn't there. And she said, well, you can't see the dean, he's home, you know, that's So I looked up his address, and I went out and knocked on his door, and it was at noon on a Saturday, and he let me in, and we were talking, and it turned out his wife had gone to Knox, and oh, we had a lot in common, <laughs> and all of a sudden, he and I were talking, and all of a sudden, there was a loud roar of airplane engines, and I, Having been around him a long time, I still rushed out to look at him, and it turned out the dean was quite interested too. So as we both stood outside his house, looking in the sky, he said, "Well, Hugh, it'll cost you a twenty-five dollar late registration fee." <laughs> so I got into law school two weeks late. It's a little harder to get in there now. <laughs> Jeez. Of course, by then you were used to starting. It seems like everything you always seem to start arrive late. You know, the yeah, college I, and, and training and being away. So I guess you get going. Yeah. Well, I I. Uh, I knew that when I had to weigh about going down to Pueblo and managing the budget store and that uh, trend, then I got reinterested in law school and everything, and I thought, oh, we don't have that child anymore, and so let's do it. And that was a wonderful experience. I loved law school, and I had a lot of good friends uh, in a small town, not in Denver, and because uh, I'd come from a small town, and really it was an ideal town. And Colorado only had about five significant cities in 1951. I mean, there was Grand, uh, Grand Junction and, and uh, Pueblo and Colorado Springs and Greeley and Fort Collins and, and about, I figured, seven towns that were 20,000 people or more. And Greeley was a very, supposedly very uh, wealthy area at the time, agriculture and everything. And I got a job with a firm that was considered to be quite a plum. I'm not sure it was in retrospect, but then I started at 150 a month, after having made 500 a month as a pilot of the war seven years before, <laughs> but uh, it was like starting over by for sure. But Gritty's been a good town, and I think it unfortunately has lost a lot of its real charm. It was a smaller town, and it was not it was a much more wealthy town, and it it sort of uh, always taken second place to a lot of the front range cities now. It was good to live in, and we've had an awful lot of wonderful friends here. There was a great community spirit. You were, you were expected to serve on every kind of board and manage every kind of fun drive and do this and do that, and, and you all did it, and your wife did it. And yeah. Not quite the same today, but... Yeah. And at some point you were appointed a judge or ran for judge? Uh, no, they had just adopted the new system of selecting judges in Colorado where there was no more politics involved and where you were selected by an impartial committee. And names were submitted by, to the government. Three, three names were submitted by a committee to the governor and he chose one. And I never thought about being a judge, really. But then I knew that the judges were stuck with politics. They had to please their parties, the people that gave them money. It was all wrong. And when this came along, I thought, you know, that might be a good, a good way to serve 
And so I was ended up being the first judge in the state that was appointed under that new non-political, non-partisan selection process. Hmm. I just I, I put my name in and I felt like I did have a good chance because I had a good reputation and I had sure. excellent recommendations and Governor Love chose me and appointed okay. yeah. And how long, how long did you serve as a judge then? Well, I was 19 years full-time, and then I, they passed a law where you could retire with full benefits after 19 years, which I did, and then I became a senior judge for as long as you could do that, which was another 12 years. And I really enjoyed that. It was agreement to serve 60 days a year throughout the state. And I, I seldom served here. I served all around the state. Is that right? Yeah. I had a judge and lawyer friends in all the towns around the state. I had been president of the Colorado Judges, District Judges Association, and done a lot of work with all the judges and doing pretty well. So that was fun. Yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're sitting in your office today. Uh, you're in your 80s. You're still practicing law? No. No. Oh, okay. Okay. No. I'm, okay. I'm here to just sort of look after things and read. Okay. I spend two or three or four hours a day. And it's a good place to get away. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, uh, as we begin to close down this interview, Hugh, uh, was there anything I didn't ask you or any stories you can remember or anything else you wanted to put on this before we... I uh, sort of ran through them all fast, didn't I? Yeah, Pretty did a very much. good job, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was going to tell you one quick thing I did forget. I, was thought of, I thought of after the guy whose place I took to go overseas, and the interesting thing was the way the Army worked. When we, learned, when we boarded the ship, the Queen Elizabeth, you came over in lighters and they were all carefully orchestrated and when you got off of that and walked up to the get on the ship the gi at the thing had a list of everyone and he said your name and they were right they had you so precise except they said the name of the pilot oh, who was in the hospital so i thought well that's interesting so they don't even know i'm going overseas but our crew got on under his crew's name and then the first mission came in Europe, and you go in there, and that's really, really, that's when your eyes are wide, and you see that briefing board, and you find out where you're going, and, and you, uh, and that was Berlin that day, and, and you uh, uh, learn all about it. It's the first time, and you wonder if you're going to be able to do it. And I look up for my place in the formation, and it isn't up there on the board. And all of a sudden, I look around, and I see that guy that's back in the <laughs> hospital's name, and I thought, that's me. If they shoot me down, He'll get his family. will get to notice. <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah. just hadn't caught up yet. Yeah, I'll be done. Through the years, uh, have you kept in touch with any of your old crew, or has there ever been any reunions with the Eighth Army or Eighth Force? I've been to several of the Bond Group reunions, oh, yeah. which have been great. And uh, actually, I think everybody had, almost all the crew had died. I was in touch with them for quite a while, and I lost touch with. I didn't try, and they didn't try for quite a while. And then a few years ago, my tail gunner located me on the internet. He got in touch with me, and we got quite involved. And then uh, uh, I'd been going to a few reunions, so I talked him into going to a reunion. And we went to a reunion up in Rapid City, South Dakota together, which was neat. I'll be done. And then yeah. he died a couple of years later. But, uh, uh. Let me ask you, uh, Hugh, how do you think that period of your life played into your life, affected your life, uh, had an impact on your life, or, or did it? Or was it just, just a, a segment of your life? Like everybody, I think it was enormous. Enormous. You grew up fast. You, you, you got your self-reliance. You got your, you'd seen the monkey, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was very different. I have no idea what would have been like otherwise. Mm -hmm. I still would have been, I'd have gone away to college and I'd have come, I would not have stayed in Galesburg and I might have done a lot of those things, but I had the total self-confidence. Yeah, that was very, it was a very worthwhile experience if you didn't get shot up. Yeah, right. Well, in closing, is there any sort of statement uh, you'd like to make to almost an open mic on anything you'd like to make a statement on as, as regards to people that may see this tape. Uh, any closing thoughts that you'd like to make? Well, I uh, unfortunately, I think 
although we haven't talked a lot about this since I wrote this autobiography, my immediate family has seen that, which covers on paper quite a bit of what we talked about today. Uh, my grandkids have shared with interest uh, some of these experiences that can't begin to, to measure in a high degree with them, but it, they've been very, very receptive. And as time goes on, I, I appreciate having the opportunity to preserve it in video, and I think that's more meaningful than the written word. I feel very flattered. I, I just returned from the honor flight okay. to New York or to Washington, and uh, what, a, what an exceptional experience that was. Even though it was two days, it was a trip of a lifetime, and I've been all over the world, and I've taken a lot of trips, but everybody felt I'd never been anything quite like that. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, wonderful. It was, it really was. Well, Hugh, I want to thank you for taking the time today to tell your story. Uh, more importantly, though, I want to thank you for your service to our country. You know, I want to thank you for doing this. I feel very indebted to your time and effort. Are you retired? I think earlier in our talk I mentioned a Major Dozier's airplane that blew up on takeoff on our fourth mission. And afterwards, somebody in the group made that artist rendition of his plane landing at our air base. Those are the ground buildings. It's not a work of art, but it's a, it's a the air base uh, hangars and things. And his plane with uh, Miss Ida, which was the name of it, that you could read on the nose and the blue tail marking of our bomb group. And they just did that in tribute of him and I bought one of those. I guess that's a question I forgot to ask. Did you ever name your plane? You know, actually, when I got over there, I flew different planes okay. that were already named. And uh, that was earlier on in the war when they were naming them. I, they named about every name you could think of anyway. So I was glad I didn't have to think one up. <laughs> okay. Along with uh, Lakeland, Florida, in primary, where I told you we had so much fun flying on that little old open cockpit first trainer, chasing the birds over the swamps of Florida and all. And that was a very exciting beginning to our career. Now this one here, that picture was taken in, in basic, which is the next stage after primary, in what I told you about being the first real airplane all metal and very throaty for a basic trainer, BT-13, which is the plane that Gil Ades was killed in and, and Bade was also. And uh, that was uh, in Macon, Georgia, and uh, I guess that would have been in the summer of 43, yeah. That's a picture taken in our yard at home on the first leave. I had two week long leaves during the three years I was in the service, and that was right after we got our wings. The gentleman on the smaller gentleman on my right is my dear old Uncle Fritz, who lived next door, and he and his wife, Aunt Fan, were like second parents. Uh, they had no children, and we spent a great deal of time at their house. And the gentleman on the left is my father, Ray M. Arnold, and my dear old collie dog that uh, grew up with me, my collie dog, Pat. I don't have a lot of pictures after that time. I don't know we weren't where people were taking fancy photographs of us after that. <laughs> yeah, I started to say that those pictures were all taken when I was still 18. Actually, that one was taken when I was just after I was 19 when I had just uh, gotten my commission and my wings and was just 19.